Welcome to the Seacrest 1883 Octagonal Barn. My name is Rich Tyler, and we're going to give you a little tour of the barn this morning, talk about its restoration and some of the background, and barns in general. This is a splendid farmstead settled in the 1800s by Joshua Seacrest, who immigrated here from Ohio at the age of 19. And he and a local barn builder, Frank Longerbeam, got together and built this barn in 1883. Quite a spectacular marvel architecturally and um, in terms of the uh, farming enterprise that went along with it. So hopefully you'll enjoy some of the discussion in the tour. Why don't you follow me in? This is the same path that the hay wagons used to come in back in the 1880s. Hello, I'm Woodrow Weaver with Senior Center Television. And we're out here at the Secret Barn to bring you a story we hope from the behind the scenes. And it's my pleasure to introduce Rick Tyler, the present owner of the barn and the, the brainstorm of behind all this beautiful structure. He came to us from Windsor, Ontario, Canada, 16 years ago. He's with the University of Iowa, and he's a audiologist. Close, close enough. Close enough. <laughs> and we also have Emily Roberts out here this morning. It's pretty early to get out here, isn't mm -hmm. it? Uh, and I should say, Rich lives in West Branch. Sorry about that. Emily Roberts uh, lives in the, in the county. And in fact, she and I are close neighbors out there. We, we live on the farm. She's a Iowa barn historian. And uh, she started taking pictures of barns in the late 1950s. So we're delighted to have both of you here. And uh, we're going to start with Rich. Rich, now you know we're going behind the scenes this morning. <laughs> what was your first impression when you saw this great barn? And I know I've seen tapes of it. It didn't look like this way back there, did it? No, it certainly didn't. Um, I actually came here um, to look at the farmhouse um, a neighbor down the street had said the farmhouse was vacant and perhaps it might be for sale. And uh, the farmhouse was in terrible condition, but the barn, of course, was spectacular. But actually, you could hardly see the, the, the barn from the entryway because there were trees everywhere around it. Um, but it was quite apparent, particularly when you walked inside the barn, that architecturally it was just unbelievable. This is quite a structure like I'd never seen before. I certainly had an interest in history and in architecture, but no farming background. But also, the place was just uh, a total disaster. There was uh, holes in the roof. There was uh, debris everywhere, including um, heaters full of kerosene and uh, piles of manure, uh, unsafe places to walk. And it was a spectacular place, but it wasn't quite clear what the future was and what my role might be if I would get involved in it. So it actually took me about uh, three or four months of considering this with the uh, owner, at that time, 80-year-old resident of uh, 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 Johnson County, Joseph Ryan. And um, we came back and forth and saw it several times. And I always wondered what it was going to do, how I was going to get involved in this property, what was going to happen to it, and what was going to happen uh, to me at the time, uh, should I undertake such an endeavor. And finally, after four months, Joe said he'd found somebody else that was interested in buying it. And uh, uh, if I may ask, is Joe Ryan still living? He today? is indeed, yes. He's still living? Yes. And uh, Joe said, uh, I found somebody else who's interested in buying it. And I said, OK, I'll take it. And of course, the, <laughs> the hurdle was, for me, uh, because the property was so enormous, was, um, was I prepared to spend a sizable amount of my life in the next few years getting involved in this. And at that point, I had no idea that there was grant money available. I had no idea if it was salvageable. I had no idea of how much it would cost. But it, in some ways, it was a magnificent structure. And in the other ways, it was like a dream for a 10-year-old boy to come and play around in an old barn and see what you could, what you could do. Well, that's, uh, 
that's uh, interesting, Rich. And as I said before, I was out here with the Historical Society. I don't know, what, it seems to me it was about four years ago, but uh, I know we had to watch so we didn't fall through the floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think uh, there was a little back entrance to get up on the second floor, but uh, it left a lot to be desired way back in those mm -hmm. days, didn't it? Yeah, it was very dangerous uh, at that time, but um, all along the, the process, it's been important for me to, to show people what's going on and to share the property. Also, to, ha to have fun myself out here, because at least uh, for me, it isn't something you could wait 15 years to start reaping the benefits of this endeavor. It was important to share it right from the start. Okay, why don't you tell us now what you've done to this beautiful barn up to date. I know it has a new roof, but uh, what all have you done there? You've done a lot of work, haven't you? Well, this is, uh, it's important to point out that this is funded by the State Historical Society under the Historic Resource and Development Program, HRDP. Uh, and without that support, none of this could have happened. Um, I guess I started off really not knowing what to do, frankly, without having any experience like this. Um, and so the uh, first stage was just to, to sort of clear out the, the barn. It was covered in from four to eight feet of loose hay and all the garbage and the kerosene containers and so on. And that all had to be cleared out. That was something I could do easily and without much thought. And with lots of volunteers, it got cleared out in a couple of months. Um, the next stage was sort of trying to see about grant applications and what, what was available. I applied for a grant to restore the barn and the, and the, um, the cattle feeding shed. And the uh, evaluation came back and said that the cattle feeding shed was in uh, uh, greater danger because it had no roof at all. They wanted to fix that first. A consultant I had at the time said that the, uh, he suggested knocking down the cattle feeding shed because it was in such terrible condition. But in fact, it's an in integral part of the whole property and has a very interesting overhead train car um, uh, mechanism for feeding the, the, the cattle out there. So yes, uh, I, when we were out here with the, uh, that group, there was a lot of interest in that they could fill that cart with silage and run it along and drop it right into the cattle feeding bunks. Now, is that is that what your recollection yes. of it? Oh, yeah. It was quite an enterprise, and everything back, of course, in that period was designed to try and save labor. Uh, it was all done by manual labor and horsepower. So probably the, the, it probably took me about one year to sort of just wander around and do what was in front of my face as much as I could. And after that time, I sort of got a better feel for what the property was like what was, uh, what was critical and what had to be fixed right away. And I was able to focus on things like um, the structure of the place, the ribs that uh, support the thing, which are 18 uh, one by sixes laminated together, had bowed out from the compressive load of the roof. They bowed outwards. And there was some uh, danger that, in fact, they would just explode from, from the weight. And so that was one of the first things that were done. They um, put seven-foot-tall, three-sided boxes, steel boxes, and then pulled them in from the outside. A new roof was essential. Um, and uh, if I might ask, that took a lot of shingles, didn't it? It did indeed. <laughs> a pretty spectacular thing that it go up, and some, some nice photographs survived from that whole process. And then the, the uh, walls had to be... Um, had to be secured every time that there was any a wind out here at all. There was all signs of creaking going on and yeah. boards hitting at each other. And every time I came out, there would be some other board had fallen off the walls or something else was missing. And so the uh, when the roofing contractor put the um, the fascia and soffits on the roof, uh, they had scaffolding up on one side. And when the scaffolding was up on one side. I would scrape and, uh, and then paint that one side with the help of volunteers. And then when they moved the scaffolding over to the next side, they would there do their job at the top, and I would be running up and down, scraping and painting the next wall. Wasn't the original color white? No, the original color was the red. Was it? And uh, that's why it's painted red. It mm -hmm. was white at the time. Sorry, the, when I bought the barn, it was white, but it was, uh, it was originally painted red in 1883. Looks 
it looks real nice now. Oh, thank and you, you can see it from the highway. There's still work to be done, but it looks a lot better than it did, believe me. Well, now, what, what about the future, Rich? Is this going to be a show place for all Iowa? What are your plans for that? I, I've heard some <laughs> uh, through the media that you have some plans, but tell us about it. Well, I think that um, my uh, direct plans are to try and restore as much as the, pro the property as I can. So, as well as the uh, as the barn and the feeding shed and the uh, the Iowa round tile silo, uh, there is an 1860s farmhouse. Um, there are two corn cribs. There's a, there's a uh, carriage house, a hog house, uh, all kinds of buildings out here that I would like to preserve. They're in the exact same state as they were in the uh, late 1800s because no one has lived on the property who has owned it since 1934 when the family lost it in the, in the Depression. So the primary goal is to try and preserve it as, as much as I can as it was in that era. Um, I want to open it up to the public as I'm doing now. And so there are um, bus tours that come here from Chicago and California. There, the first uh, wedding reception will be held out here in September. Uh, last weekend, the um, Iowa Peace Corps had a, a, a conference here. There's been uh, fundraising for nonprofit groups, including uh, a wine tasting party by the Riverside Theater. Um, the do -si do Square Dance Club has had a couple of uh, square dances in here. So there's lots of activities being used now. What I don't want it to be is, is something that it becomes so popular that they put up a McDonald's across the street. <laughs> and so I'm trying to keep it low key. And obviously, this is a hobby for me. And so it, uh, there's only so much time involved. And it's not a, a money maker. I'm doing this because I'm enjoying it. And I think it's important to do. Well, I, I think, I, I believe I read that there might possibly be a restaurant out here. Is that true? <laughs> I certainly hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned McDonald's. Well. Down the road, though, are you, is this going to be a historic uh, farmhouse and, and uh, barn that they'll go down in history as being? Uh, and we haven't talked anything about the Seacrest family who originally lived here. And uh, I believe you said that one of the distant relatives, or maybe Emily told me, would be here sometime. Is that, is that right? There, there are some survivors. Right. The a great great granddaughter in law just lives down the street, actually. Well, was that right? Um, and also, I, I got a call this uh, this spring from a family in California who were the members of the Frank Longerbeam family who discovered that I'd been restoring the property. And they're hoping to come out here that this summer and see the place as well. So it's and one of the nice things for, for me about this whole enterprise is that the people that I get to meet and talk to. It's really fascinating to, to hear people come, both people who have interest in farming, people who have interest in barns, who have interest in architecture, photographers, painters, historians, contractors, the Peace Corps, as I said. It's just, uh, I, it's been very enriching for me to, to get to interact with people from such a, a diverse background. And people usually are here because they're interested, have some interest in the property, not because they have to be here. So it's, uh, it creates a whole new dimension to my life as well. Well, how much more do you expect to do on the barn? That is, uh, I, I know <laughs> there, there's probably a lot of things, but what do you plan to do, with, we'll say, in the next 10 years? Well, the I never even thought about completing anything when I started this. It's just, it was just not part of my plan was to finish something. I never, it was such a, such a mess and there was so much to do. But it's also fair to say that I'm quite surprised that this past year, the, the upper level is, is safe and nothing needs to be done in the short term uh, in the restoration on the upper level. There's still some foundation work in the barn. But I think that probably the immediate need in the next uh, two or three years is going to be to start working on some of these uh, corn cribs and other buildings out in, on the property um, and get them secure. You're going to restore them so that they're safe and... As much and, as I can, and, yeah. And, uh, right. Well, Rich, it's been uh, anything else you want to tell us? 
Oh, I just uh, appreciate the support from the State Historical Society and all the volunteers that have come out to help. Uh, it certainly is not a one-person project. There have been many people, uh, uh, friends and new friends and um, college students and all kinds of groups have come out, Cub Scout groups, and uh, it's, been, it's been a very uh, warm experience having them come out and help contribute to the property. Well, Rich, it sounds like you're just having a great time. Can I interrupt and Why, ask? Sure. And I, I'm out. sorry. <laughs> no, I would, I'd like to know if there's any more that you can f tell us about the Secrets family and, and uh, that part, uh, how they came to build this barn. Well, the, the uh, Joshua Seacrest, um, back by 1883, had acquired 500 acres of land. And his, uh, he had made his uh, fortune, starting from virtually nothing, um, by hopping on the train in Downey, just a mile west of here, and going out to Colorado and New Mexico. And over a period of 10 or 15 years, he had bought hundreds of thousands, as reported in the historical uh, records, mm -hmm. of cattle and sheep, and shipped them back to Downey, sold some of them here, also fattened them up, and then put them on the, back on the train to go on to the markets in Chicago. And I think that uh, he built this uh, spectacular round barn probably because it was... Uh, well, the arguments were that it was, um, uh, you could get more volume and more surface area for the same amount of lumber. It was more wind resistant. We know the high winds we've had in the area. And uh, it, it, it could be, depending on the design, more effective. But I think most of all, he was a successful farmer and wanted to show off a little bit. <laughs> Must have been a successful businessman. He certainly was. Well, Reds, thank you for... Uh sharing that with us and now uh, I sort of neglected Emily here and uh, I know Emily has a lot to tell us too and Emily tell us how you became interested in barns and, and tell us I know when you look at the barn you lights just light up all over because there's a lot of history and a lot of things that tell us Tell us about that, will you? Well, for, for one thing, I've been interested in barns for quite a long time. And uh, probably I'm colored by the fact, uh, the, the fact that I uh, married a man whose great-grandfather built an octagon barn. And how could, how could you miss it? I grew up in that neighborhood. It, w it was there always. I knew about it. Uh, and uh, it's a beautiful barn and all. And it, recently put on a new roof, didn't you? Uh, it, yes, but I, did, yeah. I didn't, but getting back to how I got interested okay, in it, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, the, the thing is, uh, it, I thought it was commonplace. I didn't realize that there weren't bar, octagon bar. I thought everybody, you know, I didn't really think about it, let's confess that. But anyway, um, uh, I began uh, taking pictures, and, and I noticed that my brother-in-law, Don Roberts, that you, that you know, uh, liked to take pictures of series of things. He'd like to take a, a picture of a building, and he'd take it in the Four Seasons, or he'd take it for what was happening there at the time. And, and I got interested in Barnes, I guess, watching him. And I, uh, I then uh, later began... Um, uh, a questers club, which is a is a is an antiquers club, and when it was my turn to give a program, I decided to do one on barns. I had a lot of pictures, so I had to decide how I'm going to do that. That led to learning more about barns, and of all the variety that we have here in Iowa, and uh, it led to me to to need to classify things to to get things right. How you you just don't start showing pictures you. You, ha you have the story to tell, and I learned that story by doing it. And uh, I think when I came out here this morning, I thought of the first time that I saw this barn in, in about 1957, and I photographed it, and I, I couldn't believe it. I approached from the, from the east coming this way, and, and when, you, when you got up here close to it, you couldn't see it. It was just like you mentioned, <laughs> just full of vegetation, and uh, it was impossible to do. And then, uh, historically, uh, there was a rash of, of uh, round and octagon barns built in uh, the uh, 
19, uh, the 18, uh, about the 1880s, maybe a little earlier than that. And they, uh, and many buildings were built until around the 1920s when it, it sort of died out. The, uh, the whole Midwest was at that time experiencing a, a lot of building, a lot of building. The, the people were just coming and coming. The first settlers that came built modest buildings. Uh, the basic necessities were, were taken care of. And, and then this second great wave of building took place uh, about the 1880s. When, um, when you date the barns that are in Johnson County, for example, you notice that there were many, many, many of them built then. The first uh, um, wave of settlers built their necessities. The second, uh, after they needed to be replaced, then they thought about lovely things like this. Not many of them, but a few of them did. I'm so glad they did. Uh, it's, it's amazing how well they have stood. They must have been built very yeah. substantial, mm -hmm. weren't they? Yes, they were. Uh, yeah, but still, um, um, I lost my train of thought there for a little bit. The, uh, the, uh, the thing about this, this rebuilding, it was not only these, um, these octagon barns, it was, it was just barns in general, the, the all sorts of barns. And the ethnic tail of the people that that built these barns. I, I, I'm thinking particularly of what's called the uh, Pennsylvania style barn because this barn features some of those things. It was a barn that was built into the side of a hill usually, but out here in, in the Midwest they build them anywhere and, and build a ramp up to it. Um, this barn has a lower floor for, for the livestock. It has this ramp up to the second level and then it has this third level, which is haymow uh, and what, other storage. What was the ramp basically for? To, to the, store hay? Or? The ramp was to get access to this second level. They could bring the hay, the hay up here and, uh, and uh, transfer it to the mow. And this, this the track is up here. And, and uh, that, that was started we th the Pennsylvania barn enthusiasts say that it was started in Pennsylvania and they brought it out here, but actually it was done in Europe, in, in uh, Switzerland. And uh, there are, are people who have, uh, historians who have traced it, have found the prototype in, in, uh, in uh, Switzerland and brought it over here. So this feature of the uh, ramp and with the lower level over here. But I don't know where they found this one with the, to the uh, cattle feeding shed that, that saved all this manpower. Uh, it, it, it's fantastic. It, uh, is that the sort of thing you were wondering about? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's, uh, well, now are you through telling us well, <laughs> what, what about, the great change that's, that's coming and has been coming the last few oh, years. Oh, we aren't seeing this, this sort of barn built like this. And we haven't seen the, the standard rectangular barn being built. It, with, I can say that with, there are a few exceptions of all of, to that. Every rule does have its exception, I guess. Yes. And uh, in, in the, here in Johnson County, we have, and Washington and Iowa County, uh, we have a cluster of, uh, Amish Mennonite. We have this, it's a big settlement. And there are a few Amish people who still build uh, this, uh, the, the old style barns. But they certainly are modified. They, they, are. they, yeah, they, they don't fell the timber and hew the beams and uh, they, uh, they make modern exceptions too. But agriculture has changed dramatically and so uh, these barns aren't really necessary. The grain is, uh, is uh, stored in bins and, and dried there. It, it isn't cut and the, the sheaves brought in and dried in the barn and then flailed out on the barn floor like they used to be doing and then, and then be winnowed and then 
put into their bins. They don't, we don't do that that way anymore. There's, the modern trend is certainly away from that. And the immense machinery that's used now uh, can't be housed in this kind of a barn. They have to, they have their big steel, beautiful <laughs> and machine I, sheds. And I think too, the, even the hay that used to be stored in the barns is now wrapped up in huge round bales mm -hmm. and covered with plastic. And, and then, so there isn't a need for these, for this type of barn. But it's interesting to know that some people still build them and, and like them and... And, uh, and it's interesting and, and very profitable, uh, very wonderful for the rest of us that people salvage and save a barn like this, which is so rare, there, there isn't another like it. Thanks and, to people like Rick <laughs> Yes, here. that's who I'm referring to. The, the, that we in this vicinity are very, very fortunate. Iowa is very in, fortunate. Um, well, after, after we're gone, he will be remembered for saving this barn. <laughs> well, you know, Emily, uh, the, the June 30th storm took two beautiful barns right out in our neighborhood. Yes. And, uh, and I know Marge Miller's was built, I think, 1883, same it, as this barn. And the one that your old home... It was a 93. 93. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you think that... Uh, We'll say down the next generation or so, most of these old barns are going to go. A lot of them will go. I'm sure they will. It's everything that man builds, mankind builds. You know, eventually it it's gone. It molders away. Uh, I, we'll keep trying to save things. People will, like they're trying to save the Sphinx over in Egypt right now, yeah. <laughs> talking about rebuilding the nose or whatever. Uh, but uh, well, but let's save them as long as we can. Let's, re let's remember uh, what, what all the people ahead of us did to make things as uh, easy for us as they are. I'm, I'm certainly glad uh, we don't have to, to farm the way they did 150 That's years right. ago. That's Imagine right. it. Well, I uh, guess maybe we could ask Rich, do you, do you think this barn will stand another hundred years? Uh, well, structurally, how is it? It's fairly solid, actually, and uh, there, there certainly are wooden frame buildings in uh, Japan and China that have been around for three or four hundred years. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason why a structure like this can't be around for a long time. There are very few in, in the United States, yeah. um, just a very few. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I noticed on a, a barn that we lost, it's a little bit off the subject, um, the Miller barn, the, evidently the, the big beams sat on the foundation, but there, I couldn't see any evidence of how the, the beam was fastened to the foundation. And is there, do you know about this one? I have no idea either. It, it may be just the, the, way the weight itself. of the barn to, yeah. to hold. Uh, well, yeah. somebody uh, words <laughs> leave me now. Yeah. But where Terry Powell lives, uh -huh. that barn was, was sitting on pins. So I've been, mm -hmm. but nothing to hold it there, and the wind actually lifted that barn and shifted it off the off, off the pin. Okay. So, uh, there was something yeah. else I was going to ask you. I guess. You had said that, uh, and we'll talk some more uh, of, about this barn that as we go around and, and you will explain from the other side and little features and, and rich too. Uh, I don't know how our time is coming, but uh, I, I know we do want to get in the barn and around the outside and uh, have uh, at least rich tell us about some of the features inside. And I know, Emily, you can tell us uh, about as we go around and view the structure from the outside. So uh, at the moment, is there anything that uh, you people want to say before we go to, uh, we'll take a break and, and set up the camera upstairs? Have you got anything? Oh, I look forward to showing off the barn. Okay. <laughs> I, like, I like that. <laughs> 
Okay, now we're in the upper level of the barn in the hay mow. This was an important part of the barn because it was designed to hold 200 tons of loose hay. The hay wagon would come in in the door where we were before and would be raised up, and I have the original hay fork uh, here, and it would be raised up in this upper level, and you can see way up at the top a, a rope, and just behind the rope a steel circular track. If you follow that around just right above your head almost here, where these ropes come up, that's the original hay fork carrier. And that hay fork carrier would have, would have been swung around to the right and swung around to the left um, by uh, horses and pulleys and a horse being led out the front of the barn. And I hope to get the entire thing functional sometime this fall and have a, have a hay raising or whatever they call it. Um, I've got part of it functional now, and I'll, I'll demonstrate. Although this is baled hay, of course, this, this barn was filled with uh, loose hay, um, and they would have had this big uh, grapple fork holding it up, but I can just show you basically how this functions work. Let me put this down for a minute. That's all the original equipment just when it was built back in 1883. And that would go all the way to the top, would click into that hay fork carrier, and then be swung around, put in place, and then a fourth rope, a trip rope, would be pulled, and it would drop and fill up the barn. When the barn was full of hay, and of course it would have been filled all, almost all the way to the top of that the rope up there, at the very top, um, the when it was ready to unload the barn, they would climb up the inside of these hay chutes, and there are four of those hay chutes. They would climb up the inside and pitch the hay back down through these hay chutes to the uh, cattle, and there were 32 horses and 16 cows waiting in the lower level of the barn to be fed. Or it could actually be stopped on the middle level, and then uh, the hay would be moved on to the train car that we've already mentioned that goes out into the cattle feeding shed on the north side of the barn. This building is fascinating, as I mentioned, because of the architecture. And you'll note now there are no central support structures in this barn. Uh, many barns, even circular barns, have big posts and beams in the middle holding it up. Or they have even a silo right in the middle keeping the uh, barn and the, the roof in place. This barn is uh, unique because of the uh, laminated ribs, and I believe that uh, Frank Longerbeam got the idea to use this, uh, this lamination from uh, a barn that was built a few years later by a man named Hershey in Muscatine. Frank Longerbeam would actually go to Muscatine to buy his lumber by horse and wagon from uh, Mr. Hershey, and Mr. Hershey also built a barn with lamination, perhaps the very first one in, in, the, in the country. Um, designed by an architect from Baltimore, as I've discovered. I think it's important to have a close look at this, uh, this lamination. I don't know if you can get a shot down here close to the, to the corner. You can see this uh, lamination here up, up close. It's, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I believe it's 18 uh, layers of one by sixes that are all nailed and bolted together. And they would have done that on the, on the ground and built a huge arch that would have been uh, probably about um, 45 or 50 feet uh, from the apex to the ground, and then propped it up and lifted it with pulleys and a tripod and horsepower. And there would have been one single arch sitting above the ground with, tied with the ropes to both sides to hold it in place. And then some poor lad would have had to climb up that arch and sit on the top what a job that would have been. And his job would have been to pull up the remaining uh, arches, perhaps one at a time, one section at a time, get them in place and pull them together. So this was back in 1883, quite an architectural uh, and engineering uh, contribution to architecture. You'll also note uh, the stairways that go up here. This is, these are original stairways that, that go up from the Haymile and our suspended stairways that go up all the way to the cupola on the top. The stairways um, are 
as I said, original, so they're over 115 years old, and it took me about three months of watching the uh, roofing contractors march up and down that uh, fearlessly. It took me three months to overcome my fear, and of course there was work to be done up there, so eventually I had to overcome my fear. But I still, even today, only go up there if there's work to be done. And I point out to people on tours that that cupola was built for a, for a few reasons. One, for to, to, to provide light. Uh, two, to provide ventilation. And I point out that if I was a 15-year-old boy living on this uh, site and wanted to show off my girlfriend, I would, uh, I would walk up there and uh, enjoy the view with her, because it's quite a spectacular view, actually. Anyways, this is quite a, quite a spectacular haymow and uh, has all kinds of applications now. So uh, as you can see, there's whole tables that we have all kinds of farm equipment, uh, some tools to display, and uh, hopefully it'll be around for a while now. I think this is just a beautiful view of this uh, barn. Look particularly at the roof and uh, cupola. The uh, main part of the roof has these bell-shaped rafters that go clear to the foundation that are those laminated uh, one by sixes that Rich uh, described earlier. It, it just makes such a, a beautiful sweep as it comes, it comes down. And uh, going up to the cupola, it's mirrored up there. It's, it's the same thing. And the, I see Rich has the uh, windows open, and I'm sure they would have been open for ventilation uh, when the barn was in use, whenever they, uh, particularly when hay was curing, they wanted the, the uh, windows open. This uh, shows the uh, three sides of the barn from this view. Also, a look at the uh, windows. Those windows could have been uh, just plain, or but they do admit a light. Uh, when I say just plain, I back up a little bit. They have this uh, little cap over the window the, that is just has enough decorativeness to it that it complements the whole look of the barn. I would like for us now to look at the foundation. I see on the octagon part of this barn that it is stone and it is mortared. And on the cattle shed here, beside it, it is uh, cement. Historically, stone was used until uh, cement became available in the 80s and 90s. Uh, by, the, by the 90s, it was uh, very common. But when you look at the stone, you wonder where did it come from and where was, where was it quarried? We know there are quarries along the uh, Cedar River, not far from here. We, maybe Rich knows, maybe someone knows how the stone was transported over here. Uh, a lot of the time, they would move stone in the winter time when they could put it on um, uh, sledges so that it wouldn't have to be lifted up and it uh, would just be uh, scooted around uh, on the, the runners on the ground. And if they had a, uh, some good weather, then they would do a lot of it then. This um, part here where we're standing was likely the loafing yard for the, uh, the cattle that were fed in the shed. And on uh, um, beyond on the next uh, face of the uh, east face of the building here is a, a double door which would lead into the, uh, the uh, horse stable part of the barn. And, uh, and there are also cow stables over there too uh, where uh, they may have done milking. Uh, if you look closely, you may, you may be able to see that if you look closely, you may be able to see that the barn does have a little bit of a bow. And uh, rest assured, it has been stabilized on the uh, inside uh, to stop any more of that. It is indeed a beautiful barn.
the uh, the big pine boards that were are probably not local uh, local lumber that that are the siding possibly came from uh, the forests in uh, Minnesota or uh, Wisconsin came down the Mississippi River and uh, stopped at ports from Clinton and Muscatine. Both had uh, lots of, uh, of sawmill and uh, lumber uh, producing mills. Uh, the uh, battens uh, cover the cracks between the big siding boards. And also it's interesting to note that the, the corner boards on the f facing are, are uh, painted a contrasting color and that's a, that's a typical thing that you see in barns in the Midwest. And uh, also this is a little different view of the uh, bell-shaped roof. It, the bell goes out of sight when you're this close to the barn. It is indeed a beautiful barn. This is a shot of the silo. It's amazing that it's still standing. It's, um, Rich calls it Iowa, Iowa clay, Iowa silo. Anyway, a lot of Iowa's silo tile came uh, from a factory over uh, by Waterloo, and I'm not certain where this came from, but those are hollow tiled uh, hollow uh, tiles reinfor reinforced on the inside, but they have a lot of hollow space in there. Uh, it uh, has a, a roof which protects the silage, and uh, the silo uh, then would be emptied uh, through those doors. And I would guess that there used to be a a chute on this uh, side where where that cement uh, uh, up, uh, perpendicular slabs are that there was a chute that they throw uh, the, that they removed the silo silage throwing it down to the cart that that went on the track on the inside to feed the various cattle. I'm not much of a climber, but wouldn't it be fun to have gone up the ladder and up over the top and take a look around? This concludes our story of the Sequus barn uh, out here by Downey, Iowa. And we'd like to thank Rich Tyler, the owner, for letting us come out here. It's been my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it. And to thank Emily Roberts, the barn historian who accompanied us and uh, told us all the great things about these wonderful barns. Thank you, it's been fun. <laughs>